without further ado, these are the boys from Chapman Trip. This is Jeff. Hi. And this is Josh. Give it a round of applause. Please, Woo. Jeff and Josh. Welcome to Canada Back to So, uh, I'll leave it to you. Th th thank you, Nick. Uh, the way we run these sessions is we really like them to be interactive, so um, stick your paw in the air and ask questions um, if you like. Uh, and the most important thing to understand is that law is a lot like the tech world. Uh, ability and knowledge is inversely proportional to age, so I won't ask, answer any questions. Josh will answer some, but the really hard ones we'll give to our colleague Sarah over here. So anything really difficult, please direct it to Sarah. Josh. Thanks, uh, Jeff, uh, and thank you, Nick, for the introduction. Um, can everyone hear me at the back? Is that okay? Uh, so I guess, um, so my name is Josh Blackmore, I'm a partner in the corporate team at Chapman Trip here in Wellington and Jeff's also a partner in our corporate team. As you said, most of this has actually been prepared by Sarah Denton who's sitting there at the front, one of our young talented solicitors, so she'll, she'll do most of the answering of the questions later on. Um, I guess we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the legal framework uh, to employee share schemes uh, and then as quickly as possible I guess move on to the really interesting stuff which are the practicalities, the... Um, the tricks of the trade, if you want uh, to put it like that, and uh, some practical tips that you guys can hopefully take away and think about. Um, it is a little bit of an intimidating area, you know, issuing shares to people and getting employees involved in your company, conscious that um, people probably have a lot of questions, they've probably already done a lot of thinking about this. Um, so please do just, just wade in and get stuck in. Um, when we talk about employee share schemes, what we're really talking about is giving uh, the people that work for you an ownership stake in your business, right? So, um, you know, all of the language that we talk about and all of the um, jargon can be stripped back to that. You know, when you're giving someone an ownership stake in your business, what do you need to think about? And there are some kind of framework threshold issues that you need to understand in terms of what you can and can't do under our legal system. But there's also the actual important stuff, which are the commercial issues about, you know, what, what are the implications, actually, of giving employees ownership in your, in your business? Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Why do people have one? I mean, most of this will be pretty familiar to you guys. It's pretty common in the tech startup world, um, you know... Jesse Eisenberg gives shares to Andrew Garfield in the Actually, Facebook movie. And sorry, I see people, a few people scribbling. If, if any of you want copies of these slides afterwards, just you know, give your details to Nick, and he can flick them to you. So don't get writer's cramp on account of this. Yeah, yeah. And there's a little handout that we'll give out at the end with some of the stuff summarised, hopefully in a user-friendly form. Um, they allow startups to offer equity as part of the remuneration package, so that's obviously an incentive program for people to get them in on the ground floor. They want to have a stake in, in the business. Um, you know, they're part, of the, they're part of the environment, right? So when you're competing for talent um, uh, at the coalface, you do need to start to think about these sorts of things because probably your competitors will be thinking about them or at least the people who are competing for the developers and the other talent you're trying to recruit. Um, critically, it allows you guys to uh, allow startups to um, attract people to work for you and provide a remuneration package without um, going through a lot of cash. You know, cash burn is a big issue, as you guys will know, for startup um, companies. And so, minimising the amount of cash you have to pay out on a monthly basis to your employees is obviously an attractive thing. And if you can trade equity for cash, uh, that's sometimes perceived to be a real advantage. Uh, and of course, you know, the sort of people that you want in your business are the sort of people that are motivated and incentivised by the prospect of building um, something in the same way as you guys are. So it allows you to attract motivated and talented people um, by giving them a stake in the success of the business that you're trying to build together. Uh, this is where it gets a little bit boring, and uh, if you, you know, your eyes glaze over, I, wouldn't, I don't blame you. Um, it's fair to say that our legal system doesn't recognise an unrestricted right to offer people shares in a business in lieu of paying them money for remuneration. So you have to understand that there are restrictions on what you can do. Uh, we, we've come from a world in which um, the legal system and the framework was very restrictive, it effectively acted to, to stymie a lot of employee share schemes before they were able to get up and running. Uh, there were some exemptions available from the, 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 the law that was uh, applicable to this area, but it, they were pretty clunky and difficult to use. Happily, we can forget all about that because um, we've just gone through a round of reform of our financial markets law, and the new Financial Markets Conduct Act, which was passed a couple of years ago now, actually provides a very, very liberal uh, concession regime for employee share schemes if you satisfy certain criteria. When we talk about securities, we're talking about the whole gamut of things that you might be thinking about offering, so shares, ordinary shares in your company, 
options to at some point which might convert into shares, convertible loan notes, the sort of things that sometimes get offered in startup land. So it covers all of those things. You need to be aware of this, this framework uh, when you're offering someone effectively any sort of ownership or equity stake in whatever form in your business. Uh, there is now, as I say, a, a specific concession available for employee share schemes, but it has certain requirements that you need to meet. So you have to tick off some boxes before you can opt into that regime. Um, those, are, those are reasonably straightforward. It has to be part of the remuneration arrangement, so it can't be for the purpose of, of raising capital. So when you offer an employee shares at um, potentially a discount to market value, say, uh, you can't be doing that because you're trying to actually raise money for your business from it. It's got to be part of the remuneration arrangement. Uh, you're not allowed to raise more than 10% of your share capital in any given year from this concession. So in any 12-month period, you have to limit the number of shares or options you're effectively issuing to people or options convertible into shares to 10% of your overall capital structure. So that, that's a limitation. And there are some prescribed warning statements that you have to give to people. So commonly what, what you do is you send out an offer letter to someone, you say, I want you to take shares as part of your remuneration package, it needs some, some health warnings, some prescribed health warnings to sit on that document to make sure they understand they're not getting the benefit of all of the consumer protection provisions in the legislation. There is actually an alternative concession that people are looking at using for employee share schemes. That allows you to, uh, you may have heard of it, it's called the small offers or small personal offers con concession. It allows people, not just through equity crowdfunding, but allows people to raise up to $2 million in any 12-month period from no more than 20 people if you have a personal connection with those people. And so that's a, a slightly more potentially liberal uh, regime to use for offering shares or options to employees uh, than the actual um, concession that's designed for that purpose. So anyway, there are some options. You're able to do it. It's much easier now than it used to be, but you do have to tick some compliance boxes. Otherwise, you potentially risk giving rise to a civil claim or even a potentially a criminal claim against you if you, if you breach um, the Financial Markets Conduct Act. Uh, again, even if you opt into these concessions, you still have to be aware of certain minimum requirements. You can't mislead and deceive people. It's a bit like the Fair Trading Act. In fact, the same provisions in the Financial Markets Conduct Act. So when you're offering shares to people, even through this concession to employees, you still can't mislead and deceive the employees. You can't give them false accounts or give them an, uh, an idea about the company that's not you know, accurate or founded on some sort of verifiable information. So these are the exemption requirements that I was talking about, which I won't cover in any more detail than I have done. Um, suffice to say, it's, it's worthwhile talking to uh, someone who can give you some information about what you need to do to tick those boxes, whether it's a lawyer or whether it's someone at Creative HQ who can point you in the direction of some standard form documents. I think it's sensible to consult someone uh, when, you, when you're setting one of these schemes up. The other thing that generally gets people into trouble with these things or gives, gives rise to a lot of heartache is the tax implications of employee share schemes. Um, effectively, the benefits that accrue to the employee under a scheme um, can, you know, can be subject to tax. They are taxable benefits. Um, they don't, that's not like PAYE. It's not something that's deductible at source by the employee. It's something that actually has to be returned by the, uh, by the person, by the employee who owns the shares. Uh, and so they need to be aware that when they're taking shares as part of their remuneration, it may give rise to taxable income that then they have to return to the ID and possibly pay tax on. You need to have some thought given to structuring your scheme to manage the tax consequences for your employees. And I want to give people shares or options, and then when it comes time to actually vest those shares or options in them, it turns out that that comes with a massive uh, tax liability attached on that day, which they can't actually um, account for themselves because they don't have the cash. Uh, effectively how this works is the employee is taxed on the date the shares are acquired or the options are exercised and what's taxable is the difference in the price or consideration the employee pays for the shares or options uh, that turn into shares and their market value. So if you give someone an option to take shares and they have to pay one cent per share and on the date that they exercise the option uh, those shares are worth a dollar the taxable income for them is 99 cents and they would then have to pay at whatever their personal tax rate is on that 99 cents of income at that time that the shares vest in them. Uh, so that's an important thing to, to, to think about. So what, what sort of basis would IRD use to make them better? Well, it's, it is, it's a very good question because it's a very difficult issue um, and often the market value of shares in startup companies 
is effectively nil, or there is no market value. Um, so, so IRD will have to have to think about whether or not they're assessing the market value accurately. Um, but but it, if you have a capital raising or a liquidity event, yeah. then the IRD goes straight to that and says, well, it's got, you know, there's a pretty good benchmark. Yeah. And often the triggers for um, converting options into shares, say, uh, or shares vesting are a capital raising event. So you say to your employees, here are these shares or options, but you don't fully own them. You can't you can't sell them until we actually go through a capital raising round. But at that point, as Jeff says, you've got a market value um, uh, point that you can measure against. Um, Oh, that, that, this sort of thing happens quite often, right, where, where you do have a capital raising, but for some preference classes. Um, the best thing to do is uh, to first of all talk to your accountant and say, look, you know, what, 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 what value is most likely to be seen as at today on the ordinary shares? Because sometimes the accountant might say, look, this is pretty simple. You know, frankly, you've burnt all your cash you know, you had to do a fresh share raising because you, you need cash, I wouldn't attribute any value to it. And that's quite helpful and you have that on the record. Other times it can be more difficult and you need to, what, I mean, practically speaking, you don't want to have to go and pay, you know, 20 grand for a, 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 a formal valuation if you can possibly avoid it. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon, you know, even in those pre-share scenarios that there is a pre-money valuation of the company, right? So there is potentially a, mon a monetary value associated with the company, and that can be used then by people who do valuations to derive a value for those ordinary shares. It's not, I don't profess to be an expert in the art of valuation. Thankfully, I'm a, you know, I'm a lawyer, not an accountant, at least from my perspective. Um, but it is, it is difficult. But as Jeff says, what you're really trying to achieve is to structure your share scheme, your option scheme, in a way which avoids those difficult questions. The easiest way to do that is just to give people shares for nothing on day one, right? When, the, when they start up the company with you, the, 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 the ground floor employees. And at that point, probably those shares are worth nothing. But it becomes more difficult when you're trying to attract people into the scheme on an ongoing basis, particularly as your company starts to potentially become more valuable. How do you manage the risks associated with them um, crystallising a tax liability uh, at some point in the future? Uh, and that's one of the things hopefully we'll talk about uh, towards the end of the session. But in general, um, I think that you know, from a tax perspective, one of the one of the attractive things is obviously the, any gains in value after the shares uh, vest in the employee, so become owned by the employee, unless they hold them on revenue account, and there's deemed to be a capital gain associated with the shares, which in New Zealand, uh, thankfully, is reasonably rare. Although the ID is becoming a bit more aggressive in that regard, those aren't uh, those aren't taxable gains, so they won't have to pay tax on the difference in market value from the date they acquire them to the date they sell them. Uh, so, so that's not something you as an employer have to, have to necessarily worry about. So I think I'll hand over, um, I mean any questions at that point other than the ones we've, we've covered on the legal framework? Uh, in, um, in terms of the tax treatment? Uh, 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 so in terms of the tax yeah. treatment, effectively n nothing. It will still be taxable income to them, so they'll have the same issue as an employee. In terms of whether or not you can take advantage of the employee concession, yeah. uh, I think you can. You can take advantage of it for people who are independent contractors because it's recognised as, as effectively a form of employment in New Zealand these days. And you can, you can certainly take advantage of it for the small personal offers exemption if they're connected to the company. So short answer, you should be able to treat them in the same way. Um, but it's a, it's a good question. So I was going to hand over to Jeff at this point, and he's going to talk about uh, the terms of some of these arrangements and the things that you have to think about, and then some practical issues, and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So I, I sometimes think in terms of analogies, and um, I had a good one this morning where I spent three hours with the guy who installed our in-house... Uh, uh, Music system. Music system and wireless network and everything, trying to work out why our NAS drive had completely blown up. And it hasn't blown up, 
After three hours, we worked out the reason is that our NAS drive is not, not optimized for Safari. I downloaded Firefox, it works a dream, but it was just blowing up with Safari. Um, which is to say that even though they're both browsers, and you think, well, they've all got to work, shit, how hard can it be? In fact, it turns out there's quite a, quite a bit of uh, devil in the detail. Um, employee share schemes are probably more complicated than your average browser <laughs> on occasion. They, they do come in all shapes and sizes. And so the, um, w what we often see, surprisingly often, actually, is people who say, oh, yeah, and I've told the employees that they'll get an equity interest. Um, so have you promised them that? Yeah, 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 it's in the agreement. You go, right. Have you thought about what that might mean? No. Why? So the first message here is that there is no such thing as a standard option scheme or a standard employee share scheme which is good and bad news, right? The bad news is that don't go to somebody and say, I just want the standard. I mean, they'll give you something, but that doesn't mean that it's right for you. You know, just like Safari turns out not to be right for my NAS drive, it doesn't mean that it's not it's right for you. The good news, though, is that actually if you do it properly, what you, what, what you do is you focus on a bunch of the important questions so you get it right from the first time. And there's trade-offs. So what, what we thought we'd talk about is some of the things which we see often people having to trade off and think about as they design their, their, their scheme. So, um, a sort of non-exhaustive list, and you might have others, so please feel free to interject. What, one is, how broad do you want this scheme to be? I mean, is this just for some targeted senior staff, or is this, this for just for some particularly talented coders, or is this for, for, for everybody? Um, so you've got some decisions to make about that, and, and that, that involves a whole lot of questions, not just about how much equity do you share and, and, and you know, how broadly do you want, but, but the dynamics um, amongst the people. You know, you, Sometimes people are very concerned about creating in-groups and out-groups, um, want everybody to, to sort of be in a position to feel the love when the thing turns into the next um, Instagram. But there's some trade-offs there that you need to think about, and, and which does have impact on the design of the scheme, and we'll come to some of that shortly. So an important one is shares or options. Uh, convertible notes are theoretically possible, but you don't often see them in your standard employee share scheme arrangement. But shares and options, so a share, a share in the company, your own share in the company, an option, you've got the right but not the obligation to acquire a share in the company later. And there's pros and cons for all of them. Um, the thing about shares is that if somebody's got shares, then they do actually own part of the company. And then that they've got all sorts of rights under the Companies Act and under the constitution of the company, you know, right from basic stuff like they've got to be sent notices of meeting through to things like, you know, the ability to actually materially adversely impact on your ability to make decisions unless you're quite careful about the, 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 the terms on which they hold the shares. Options, much simpler. You just say you get some free options and you can convert them into shares if you pay X dollars, 50 cents, a dollar, whatever it is, a share to the company, and then you can, you can be quite flexible about when they can exercise the options. Sometimes it's, well, between years three and five. Sometimes it's if we do a fundraising. Sometimes it's if there's, you know, immediately prior to a liquidity event. You, know. um, you can put hurdles, you know. You don't get to exercise your options if you're not here anymore, if you haven't met your KPIs, if the company isn't performing. You know, you can design the scheme in the way you want to, to set the right incentives. So this is all about setting incentives and creating the right dynamic. And each company is a little bit different in what incentives they want to set, what dynamic they want to, they, um, that they, they want to have. Um, so if you've got options, what's the strike price, price for your shares? So, you know, sometimes you see option schemes which are theoretically an option scheme, but it gives you the right to buy shares for five cents. Other times, the right is to buy shares for a meaningful amount of money. And clearly, the amount of value which is given away depends on whether you're, it's actually a, a right to, sell, to, to buy shares really cheaply or for a meaningful amount of money. One of the really important ones is control rights. So, even if you have an option scheme the employees will have the right, at some stage, to own shares. And you really need to think about what that's going to mean. 
when they're shareholders, do you want them to be shareholders just like you? Do you want them to have a vote? Um, now, there's a trade-off here, right? If you say, well, you don't have real shares, you have non-voting shares, fine. And, and you do see this, but they're not, they're not as valuable in a monetary sense. Uh, if you have a liquidity event, they probably have to convert into something else. You have to have some more complicated arrangements for what to do in certain circumstances with them. And also, they don't necessarily provide the same degree of motivation to the employees. Because, and, and part of this is actually having the employees think, you know what, when this company becomes the next Facebook, I'm going to be a squillionaire. Ah, you know? But you don't want them thinking, but not as much of a squillionaire as that person over there because they got voting shares. So there's a bunch of things you just have to think about um, in here. If the employees are going to have ordinary shares, then you want to think quite hard about the terms of the shareholders' agreement. Now, most startups will have a shareholders' agreement between the founders and then between the founders and, you know, the, the, the round one uh, uh, funders, whoever. Um, and that will have a bunch of stuff around control rights. You know, you can't, you can't decide to stop being a tech company and buy pig farms unless... 95% of the shareholders vote in favour. You can't issue shares in a way which dilutes the existing shareholders down, you know, etc. It's a bunch of standard protections and shareholders agreement. You need to think about whether those are going to be appropriate for minorities. Um, and you, but you also don't want to... Uh, I mean, I have seen shareholder agreements for minorities which effectively say to the minorities, your shareholders but you do everything you're told. You know, the deal is, you promise to do everything you were told, you basically have no voting rights. So that's an option open for you. And, and sometimes, as I said, some, sometimes people want to say, you know what, we want the shareholder, we want the employees to feel like they're actual shareholders, um, but they're getting these shares potentially for free, so we're not having them create any issues for us. So the deal is, you're a shareholder, but you do exactly what you're told all the time. Okay? Uh, other times... That might not uh, that might not work, particularly actually if you are asking the shareholder, the, the the employees, to give up some meaningful value or to contribute some 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 meaningful value. So you're saying to them, look, I can only pay you 80% of what's a market salary, but I'm going to give you some shares, or I'm going to give you some options, but you've got to pay a dollar a share to get the shares. So there's some meaningful value value going in. You can't then say to them, you know, but the thing is, you don't get any real control right because you do exactly what I tell you. So then you need to think about, you know, what level of control is it appropriate for them to have? And, and we're typically talking about negative control. So what, what level of thing do you want them to be able to block or to join with other minority shareholders in, in blocking? And again, there's all sorts, that, you know, that there's, there's, there's any range of things that, that can get covered here, but the typical things uh, that you have... Uh, uh, Controls around further share issues. So you want to make sure that the employees um, can't block a further capital, found, cap, capital raising round, but also don't get, um, don't get diluted down unfairly because of that. So some provisions around that, there's any number of ways to deal with that. You want to make sure that if, for example, there's a significant number of employees and they want director representation, that that is maintained up to a certain, you know, so long as they've got a collective shareholding above a particular um, level. One of the really important things that crops up, particularly with minorities, is what's called drag along rights and tag along rights. So the flip sides of the same coin. So a drag along right is the ability for majority of shareholders, if they're going to sell out to somebody, to drag the minorities with them. Because obviously, you know, Mark Zuckerberg rocks up and says, I really like this, and um, here's 300 million for all of your company. You don't want to find yourself in a position where you've got one minority shareholder going, nah, it's worth 450. <laughs> um, you know, um, you want to be able to say, look, X number of us, 75, 90, whatever it is, want to accept Mark's offer, and you're going to as well, because we've got drag along rights. The flip side of that is tag-along rights, which minorities want, which, the, which the, the, the employees want. They don't want to find themselves in a position where 
the majority of shareholders are sold out to Mark Zuckerberg, and Mark Zuckerberg saying, you know, I'll give you two cents a share, or you can sit there and get no dividends and, you know, whatever. Um, so they want the ability to say, look, if you're selling out to everybody, then you've got to. You, you can't sell out without us selling as, as well. Um, Preemptive rights, very common in shareholders' agreements. Um, one shareholder sells, they've got to offer to all the other shareholders first. But you do need to think about whether you actually want that to apply both ways. If the, share, if the, if the employees want to sell, you certainly want them to be forced to make a pro rata offer to all the other shareholders. But do you want to have to make an offer to all the employees if you're looking to sell out? No, yeah, maybe not. So there's a lot of... Um, of things it's worth taking the time to think about when you're designing your employee shareholding um, scheme. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, just on that, and one of the things that is always strikes me is how many people don't seem to apply the same level of rigour to bringing employee shareholders in as they would to bring another set of shareholders into their company. So these are all really functions of decisions you make if you're bringing someone else into the ownership structure of your company. And um, really, they're not unique in some ways to, to employees. But for some reason, um, you know, the employment relationship seems to throw up a whole different set of considerations for people about you know, the nature and extent of rights that people get as shareholders in the specific company. Um, and that's often because you know, it's going great, right? We're all friends. We're, you know, you're employees. We're all working alongside each other. It's a common venture. We've got a common purpose. Fantastic. Um, it's amazing how often those situations go wrong later down the track, and that's either because the company makes too much money or doesn't make enough money. You know, um, in either situation, you know, people tend to start to think about maximising their own position, and that's fair enough. Uh, and at that point, you end up having a look again at the agreements you signed uh, when you brought them in or when they came in from their perspective and, and trying to understand what actually your rights are. And if you didn't give enough thought to those up front, in the same way as a shareholder dispute can become really nasty, boy, it can become really nasty between employees uh, and employers uh, if these things aren't, aren't sort of worked out up front. Well, one of the things which is often uh, included in these arrangements to address that is qualifying arrangements. So qualification involves what do you need to do to get in in the first place or to exercise your options in the first place if it's an option scheme. You know, do you have to meet some KPIs? Does the company have to meet some hurdles, etc.? But then there's an ongoing qualification requirement. So, do you want employee shareholders to still be shareholders if they leave? Maybe that's fine. Do you want them to still be employees if they leave and go and work for the competition? Maybe that's not so much, it's not so fine. Do you want them to be employee shareholders if they leave and go to go and work for the competition? And the reason they left is that they were useless and they stole money from the till and you fired them. Huh, possibly not. So you need some arrangements to deal with how you're going to deal with exiting employees. There's a very common concept called good leavers and bad leavers. And often employee shareholding arrangements will distinguish between how you treat good leavers and bad leavers. One of the things that is often done well, with employees who, employee shareholders who are leaving for companies who don't want them to still be on the share register is to say, we can buy you back. At which point you say, well, who can buy them back? And at what price can they buy them back? And a very common way to deal with this uh, is to say, well, we buy you back at some independently assessed fair value. Yeah. So that means you've got to spend money on an independent assessor. Okay. Sometimes then people say, well, actually, we're just going to have a formula. And there's a formula that's going to apply. So you know, we can buy you back at, on the basis of this formula. And then years down the track, they actually realise that that formula was done. And I, I, um, I came across this years ago with a company that came to me with a terrible problem. They had a lot of employee shareholders, and they had an employee shareholding scheme. And the employee shareholding scheme said, if you leave, you must sell your shares back to the company, and the company must, unless, it will, unless it's insolvent, buy them back from you. And it buys them back on the basis of this formula. And this formula was an EBITDA multiple. You know, everyone know roughly what I mean by EBITDA? You know, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortisation. It's an earnings concept multiplied by um, 4.5 or something. And the EBITDA figure was an average of the last three completed financial years. So guess what was happening? They had, they had two really good years 
and they were having a shit year. Sorry, they had three really good years, and they were in their, their fourth, and it was really shitty. And employees were bailing because they wanted to actually exit at a price which involved the three really good years EBITDA rather than have their price reduced by the four years EBITDA. So you, you really have to think quite hard about the detail of these arrangements, which is not, I mean, I think I, I know I've said a lot, this is, you know, there's no one size fits all. I don't want you to think that these things are impossible. I don't want you to think that they're so complicated you shouldn't bother. The message actually is not that. The message is that there's the technology around to do these things, but it does, in, it, it, it does involve just thinking quite hard about, about what you want to do. Some other things, takeovers code. I'm sure everybody thinks the takeovers code is just for you know, big you know, billion dollar companies, doesn't apply to me. And if you've got more than 50 shareholders, it applies to you. And that's a real bummer. That means that nobody can acquire more than 20% of the company without making an equal offer to all shareholders, and you've got to get an independent advisor report, and uh, just, a, just a palaver. Um, I know of a number of companies which have mistakenly become takeovers code companies because they've needed some capital. They've gone to a friendly investment bank who's, and said, raise me some capital, and the investment bank's raised all this money from high net worth individuals, and they've got 60 shareholders. And then suddenly they want to do something else and they come to us and we go, well, you can't. Not that way because you're now subject to the takeovers code. So you need to think about this. And, and one way to deal with that is to actually not have all your employees holding directly, but to have all your employees holding via another employee vehicle. And actually often other investors, you know, uh, you know round A, round B, etc. investors, will want to see that because they don't actually want to have the hassle of a whole lot of little shareholders. They're quite happy for there to be a vehicle which holds the shares for all of the shareholders and then have the shareholders sort out their arrangements amongst themselves. Don't care. Uh, and that also deals with takeovers code issues. It can also deal with financial reporting issues because actually sometimes you can think of better things to do with your money if you're a startup than spending it on compliance obligations, one of which is the obligation to prepare IFRS compliant financial statements which you have to do if you have more than 10 shareholders, unless 95% of the shareholders unanimously vote each year not to do so. Well, you might want to try and avoid that. Um, and again, it's just more generally, if you have a widely share held share register, even if it's not 50, so you're not subject to takeover scope, it can, be, it can be a hassle. It can actually be a hassle just keeping track of all this stuff. Uh, particularly when you're a startup, you've got better things to do. You don't have a compliance officer. You don't have an in-house counsel who's paid to actually just make sure everything's running tickety boo, it's a hassle. So you another thing to think about and try and simplify. Finally, a couple of things there. Um, interest free and concessionary loans and use of trust structures. This is more a feature of employee shareholding arrangements for bigger companies, particularly listed companies, um, than in the startup space. But you do see employee shareholding schemes where um, the the way it works is the employee buys shares, or the employee gets shares, and those are funded by a loan from the company. And that loan is generally limited in recourse to the shares. In other words, the employee doesn't have to pay back the loan beyond the value of their shares. Um, and often, and I've seen that in the sort of small company, not startup, but small company space, where the company's got cash and it wants senior management to be motivated, so it's lent them the money to buy the shares, and then so long as they're a good lever, then their, their obligation to repay the loan is limited to the value of the shares. Um, what you sometimes see that in association with is a trust structure, so that the, the employee gets the shares, but they're held in a trust, and they don't come out of the trust and go to the, to the employee until a later date, a vesting date, when they're really the shareholders. And you think, why would you do that? One of the reasons that you might do that is that, because going back to the tax stuff, that any gain, that any benefit the employee gets when they get their shares compared to the actual value of the shares is taxable to the employee. Then they get the capital gain after it. So the earlier the employee gets the shares, the better it is for them, because then subsequent capital gain is going to be not taxable, generally, you know, unless they're doing something weird with shares and trading them a lot. Um, so the, the employees might want the shares when the shares are worth nothing. 
rather than waiting till the shares are worth something, and they have to then you know, trigger an option and pay some tax. Um, however, the company might not want the employees to get the shares just on day one and be able to do everything with them. Hence an arrangement under which they're held by a trust and they don't vest in the employee until later on. Now sometimes these arrangements are quite simple. They vest in the employee so long as the employee is still here in three years' time. It's like just an incentive to hang around. Sometimes, though, people want to say, oh, well, they vest in the employee if they're here in three years' time and they've had all their KPIs and, 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 and. You really have to be very careful about that. The, the approach the Inland Revenue Department takes is we actually take notice of when they really vest. So if there's a whole lot of things like KPIs hanging around and you don't really get them out of the trust and into your name unless you satisfy your KPIs, and those KPIs are things like mm, satisfactory performance in the view of the chief executive, then the IRD is going to say they don't invest until you've hit all those KPIs. And so all the value increase up to that point is taxable to the employee. Okay. So there's quite a lot of uh, science that goes around making sure you can get the benefits of getting the shares to the employee in a tax-effective way without actually losing control if you don't want to lose control over what the employees do with their shares at that point. Eyes are probably glazing over. Yes? Question um, Sorry. about the ownership of the trust structure. Yes. So you've got trustee responsibility there and also yes. for the, the employee scheme for long shareholders, you've got directorship responsibilities for the employee. Yeah, I mean, enlisted, yes. enlisted company land usually... Um, You'll have a potentially a trust company which is owned wholly owned by the company, the, the listed company, and uh, management will serve as directors on the the um, company that's acting as the trustee. If you know what I mean. So, um, but but and those things are, are quite complex, and so a lot of listed companies have a trust company subsidiary that they own, uh, which manages all that. I'm conscious that um, we've talked. There's been quite a bit of jargon, um, mainly because. Um, that makes us feel comfortable because it's what we talk about all the time. Is there anything there that um, anyone didn't understand and would like us to go back over? Um, strike price, options, vesting, those sorts of concepts. Did that all make sense? The comment you made quickly about people who are employees and who might be trading shares yes. on the side? So, yeah, so um, for tax purposes, there's a distinction between a thing called capital account and revenue account. So, um, think, think of um, somebody who gets paid some money, puts some money aside um, each week and invests it in the share market because that's their retirement pool. Uh, or buys a rental property because that's what they're going to you know, use for their retirement. Well, that's fine. That's what's called capital investment. You're investing it. You're not thinking about selling it. You're just, you know... You might sell it. You know, you might sell the shares if they rock it up in value. You might sell the property if you need, if you want to buy a boat. But actually, you're not thinking of doing this as a business. Contrast with that with a day trader or a property investor who spends all their time speaking on the Auckland property market, or a day trader who spends all time, all the time in front of their their screen, flicking in and out of stocks, just trying to get little bits. So that's their business, right? They are buying the shares or buying the property, intending to resell them and make a profit. If that's, if that's the gig that you're in, then any profit you make is taxable. Similarly, any loss you make is deductible because your business is trading. So generally the way that the, um, the, the, the difference is if you, if you buy something for the purposes of resale, if you buy it with the intention of reselling it, then you may be on revenue account. If you just buy it as an investment, it's capital account. So m most people, their investments are generally on capital account. It's only people who do a lot of trading who are generally on revenue account. And so what, what happens for people like that? You know, some people do want to do a little bit of playing around, a bit of day trading, a bit of fun, um, and then an investment portfolio. And, and people like that should actually split those two. You know, have a, a revenue account company, which does their, their revenue speculation, if you like, and then their investment company or their investment trust or whatever, which just is the money they put away for their retirement. Yeah, 
sorry, uh, sorry, there was a tentative hand here. I'm not sure if she got. Did, were you putting your hand in there? Oh, okay. Sorry, it was just a, it was just a yawn. That's explicable. <laughs> I was speaking. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, if you guys hear on when you value the business, I appreciate a lot of startups. Um, they haven't had a proper valuation yet. And they're working. Yeah. They're setting these schemes up. It's better to value them first before you put the scheme in place. Or does it really matter? Or do you have any thoughts on it? I mean. G g generally, it's not going to be too hard to establish a pretty low value for a company which really is a genuine startup, right? You don't have any external capital, and you don't have any validation. You know, I mean, if, if you're really early stage, you don't, you know, you've got an idea and you've got to sit down and build it. You don't have any contracts. You don't even have a beta out there. You know, much less an investor who's come in. It's pretty simple. At the point at which you get some third-party investor coming in, it becomes a little bit more tricky because, you know. If they pay a million bucks for seventy percent of the company. It's not that easy to say that the rest isn't isn't worth you know, three hundred fifty thousand. I mean, I think as a founder, you you know you want to know what sort of value you're giving away, right? So you want to have some sort of appreciation of that before you set up one of these schemes. Um, and actually, at the end of the day, valuations are just based off data points, right? So valuations are based off um, EBITDA multiples, revenue multiples, um, you know, potential value of intellectual property. If you don't think you have metrics at the time you're setting up a share scheme which are going to translate into real world, real dollars, you can probably feel pretty comfortable you're not giving away much value. But obviously if you do have those things, you might start to think more, I think, about having some idea of what the value of your company is before you establish a share scheme and give away some of that value to employees. That would be my take. The, the, the mismatch is generally founders who spend quite a long time and quite a lot of their own money building up the IP and you know, if they put it on the balance sheet, there's quite a lot of value sitting on the balance sheet. So you know, generally the tendency is to think that the company is worth much more than it actually is. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, you know, particularly for startups, you don't want to be you know, commissioning formal valuations, etc. So I would start with your accountant, general, and say, look, uh, is there any real basis to attribute any meaningful value to this? And if so, what are we going to get a ballpark? Well, and, and the reason I ask the question is, one of the reasons we've been struggling with is that we give shares to uh, start shareholders, we just give them shares, it's even a huge percentage, and it's sort of like a bad percentage. If they're buying into the business, they're not buying into the business. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, it, and that is difficult. If you actually are asking people to put put meaningful money in and you know, have some, some real skin in the game, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's a haggle, it's an agreement, and there are, as Josh says, there's, there's touch points that you can use. But in that early stage space, there's no science to it, and a lot of uh, early stage investors just, you know, they kind of they sort of quietly admit that it's a little bit hit and miss. You just you chuck your money at a whole bunch and see them do nothing and another two sort of squiggle along for a little while not being spectacular and you hope for number ten to, to be great. So, um, I, I, I always think that the accountants are the best place to start with that. But they also see a lot of us and be able to give you some... Um, quite often they, they will have some fairly quick and really rules of thumb, which are going to be quite, quite applicable. By the time things come to us, generally price has been determined, so I, I wouldn't, um, you know, numerate as Josh is, I, I wouldn't be rushing to him for valuation. No, I wouldn't be either. Yeah? Can a sort of a compulsory employee buy back for Yeah. Oh, very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good as in the eye of the beholder. Um, well, t I mean, it tends to be, you know, it's sort of in some ways easy to define a bad, uh, you know, good lever, right? So someone who's leaving because, um, you know, they've had a, a, you know, an event in their life which causes them to be un unable to work. Typically, that's defined as a good lever, right? You haven't left because of any fault of your own. Um, you know, you, you, you know, situations where you've been disciplined or there's been misconduct, clearly that's going to lead you more towards being a bad lever. The grey area is in the middle where um, you know, someone leaves the business and there could be a range of reasons that they leave. It might be 
their fault, it might be the company's fault, it might just be they want to move in a different direction. That becomes, again, just like any other part of this process, a haggle as to whether or not that commercially is, is a bad lever situation. And again, depending on how much leeway you give to an employee, that makes it more or less attractive and then they do a different trade-off in their mind between that and remuneration or the other options elsewhere, right? So redundancy is more generally seen as good leaving? Which is a problem, right? Because sometimes, you know, the best way to get rid of a problem employee is, is to decide that you need to restructure the business um, and make the position redundant. Um, and that can be unattractive if that means they're a good lever, but it's just like... Generally... There's a difference between employee share schemes where the employees really don't pay anything in. You know, I mean, it's a, they, what they're giving is the sort of sweat of, of, of their labours, um, as opposed to schemes where employees do actually have to put meaningful value in. You know, if employees are actually putting meaningful value in, and sometimes you want that, you really want them to feel committed, not just like, no, oh, it's you know, icing on the cake, but I don't really care. Then all of these things become much more meaningful for them. You know, and, their, and, and in particular the arrangements around when they leave. You know. um, so a redundancy, yeah, OK, that's important for them to be a good leader because if they're made redundant but they're a bad leader and they've got to repay a loan or you know, they have to sell their shares back at a really low price, that's problematic for them. Yes. So the, the, the shareholders' agreement will set out the arrangements amongst the, the shareholders. The employment agreement will say this is what you are, you know, you are entitled to participate in this scheme on the following basis. So. But in terms of good lever, bad lever, that doesn't tend to bite. In ter- if your question is, is that something that's dealt with by employment law, not generally as it relates to shareholdings. That tends to be something, in my experience anyway, that you would see spelled out because what we're really talking about is not the consequences of whether or not you can take an employment relations claim against your employer for uh, unjust, you know, unjustified dismissal. What we're really talking about is w- what happens to your shares and the circumstances when you leave. So it's really it's a shareholding issue. To the Obviously it has an interface with your employment, but it's not really an employment law if, issue, if you know what I mean. Um, I'm really sorry, I have to go and take New Zealand's next Stevie Ray Vaughan to his guitar lesson. Um, sorry, some of you are probably too young to remember those students. Probably all of you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'd like to stand around and, and chat, but um, I'll leave with a couple of were there any? I mean, I'll be around for a while, so if you want to come up and ask questions, I'll be here. But were there any more questions before I think Nick's going to wrap up? I'm going to finish with the last question. Unless anyone's got a huge pressing one, just wanted to flip, flip it around a bit, Josh. What advice would you give to employees who have been presented with um, equity as part of the remuneration package? It's 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 a really good question because I mean it actually isn't that hard an answer because it's the flip side to all of this, right? So if you're an employee who's been offered sweat equity, um, you know, actually tying up quite a significant part of your life in a company and, prim- you know, your primary issue is going to be, well, how do I realise that my investment of sweat equity if it turns out that it's worth something? So in situations where, is, you know, is we're in a lever situation, ha- how am I going to get my money out? Um, I- I'm entitled to resign as an employee and I'll walk away and I've got my wages or whatever, but am I going to be able to actually realise my investment in the company via my 2% shareholding or whatever in a meaningful way? Or am I going to be forced to effectively throw myself on the mercy of the other shareholders as to what value is going to be realised? I mean, that would be the key thing, and I've actually, we have advised people on that, and often it's in the situation where they've already agreed everything and they're trying to work out how they get out. Um, and oftentimes your advice is actually your shareholders agreement rights or your rights under... Um, the terms of your shares or options aren't great, um, and so often our advice is just just make, you know just make yourself as difficult as possible until they pay you off. But that's not a great that's not a great position to be in, obviously, uh, and, and not a lot of people are necessarily willing to do that. Um, so, so would, the, would the onus be on the employee to get that clear prior to signing the employment agreement? It's it's hard. Their employment uh, employee protection around. No, the Look, there might, there might be in scenarios where you'd really, as an employee, been um, badly dealt with. So, for example, if you gave up all of your entitlements to any sort of remuneration in any cash form, 
um, you might have a claim against the the the, sh the company for um, you know that you've, you effectively haven't been paid what your minimum entitlement is under employment law. For example, you might have some rights. I wouldn't rely on them. And often in a situation where you're trying to make a claim against the company, it's probably because the company, you know, things aren't going that well, and there may not be any money there anyway. So. Um, so I wouldn't rely on those things. It's possible that you might have some rights under employment law, um, but I would, and it's harder for employees because you know it's hard for an employer and a founder to go and seek legal advice or accounting advice and pay for that sort of things or go and search out the sources of wisdom. It's even harder for an employee who has no idea and is really excited by the prospect of owning shares in this company, but actually it turns out that's not the end of the story as we've kind of walked through. Um, I... I you know, from, for, for my part, and, and and this is not just because I'm a decent human being, which I am. Um, if if I if we're advising someone who's setting up an employee share scheme, a founder, a company, you know, we're advising them to make sure their employees know that they can go and get independent advice, or that they should possibly talk to someone. And we can put them in touch with a lawyer. You know, because it actually saves people a lot of heartache down the track to make sure everybody understands the deal that's being struck when they come into it. Josh and Sarah are sitting around, so any more questions you can't have a chance.